Hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, I'm Matt Carver, Matthew Carver. Am, am I a little loud? It seems really loud up here. No? Is it good? Awesome. Um, and this is the new rules of the responsive web. A little bit about myself. I am a senior technologist at Big Spaceship in Brooklyn, New York. I'm the author of The Responsive Web by Manning Publications. Um, still being written. It's in MEEP form, though. We'll get to that a little later. And I spoke at HTML5 Texas 2011. Um, how many of you were here for the conference last time? How many of you were here when I talked last time? Well, um, the talk was called The Responsive Web Programming for the User. And it was um, kind of like my first talk on this whole responsive web design thing. Um, and since then, a lot has changed in my life. Like, uh, I've, it's been about a year and a half, and my first thought in writing this, this talk was how much I've changed since then and how much responsive web design has changed since the last time I talked about it. For me, I left Dallas and went to New York City. Uh, this was a change of, it took like four days and 1,500 miles. I crossed the country. It was amazing, beautiful experience, grueling and awful. Um, one thing I, as a recently like Texas transplant or Texas expat, I can tell you is like as soon as you come back to Texas, you immediately are more Texan than you were when you left. Like I showed up, got my car at the airport yesterday, got Franklin's barbecue and shot a gun, like, like that. And similarly, like the uh, responsive web has become the sort of buzzword for something that's been around for a while and has really exploded since 2011. Um, here's a Google Trends chart. Uh, in blue, you can see the responsive web, or responsive web design. Uh, in red, adaptive web design. And in yellow, mobile web design. Mobile web's been around for a while. Adaptive has stayed a little bit and a little bit of spike. But for responsive, around 2010, 2011, it blew up, and now is really, really popular. Um, a friend of mine went to NYU, went to this publishing course, and one of the lecturers was a big wig at like a magazine um, that like, if I told you the name of the magazine, you'd be like, oh, I've read that in the last month. Um, she knows nothing about what we do. She knows that she gets on the internet and looks at things, but she knows what responsive web design is and talked about it in her uh, little, her little talk. Um, it's kind of become a ubiquitous, like, moving buzzword that's, that's kind of got the attention of everyone remotely involved in what we do. Similarly, I was this little hipster dude when I left New, uh, Dallas, right around, like, hipster level 25, like a fair, like, flannel shirt, beard, beards, all of my friends in flannel. Now, I'm killing it, man. This is an actual Instagram of me in Brooklyn crashing a 17-year-old vegan girl's birthday party. I showed up while they were singing happy birthday. It was amazing. I'm hitting like 99 right now. It's killer. So like I changed in a year and a half, a technology can change dramatically. Um, and if you don't kind of check yourself and see where you're at at the moment, you have an opportunity to let a lot of things get by. Since the last time we talked about this, two iPhones have been released, um, obviously, and they have different screen sizes, which is an important distinction. Uh, smartphones are now the norm. They're the standard. Um, feature phones or regular cell phones are almost extinct. Tablets have grown in reach and variety. And like I said, responsive web design has become a near ubiquitous buzzword. It's on every web design blog there is. And this is how it's kind of affected me. This is my desk. Um, I use all these devices in a day. And each one of these has a different function. Uh, the desktop and the laptop are primarily for work. The tablet is for home. I use it whenever I'm at home. And I basically use my phone in the subway and the toilet now. Um, I'm very much like that second screen person. If you ever hear like marketing people talking about the second screen, you sit there with your tablet, your second screen, while you watch TV. That's my life now. Another way to put this, I use my desktop, my laptop, 
and my desktop for creating. I use my iOS devices for consuming. Um, this is a big distinction. It's, it's a pretty revolutionary one in the last like decade or so, because traditionally, uh, we've, made change, we've made sites on the same device that the site is consumed on. So we go into our office, we work on a laptop, and we anticipate the user to engage that site on a laptop using keyboards and mice and things like that uh, that we use when we make it. But this isn't the case anymore. So it's a big revolution, and with every revolution uh, comes the slime of a new bureaucracy, as Franz Kafka, the cheeriest man alive, said. Um, He's a real downer, but it, he's got, there's some truth to that. Um, so in that, in that vein, uh, let's talk about the slime of a new bureaucracy. Rule number one of the new responsive web, responsive design doesn't end with squishy. Um, so somebody talks to you about a responsive site, says check out this link uh, to this cool new responsive site that so-and-so did. The first thing you do, what do you do? You scale the browser, right? Um, so you grab the little like, cursor and you make it small and you see how everything refactors and animates and it's all very cool and impressive. Um, you might pull up Inspect Element and start like, poking around in the console and see what's going on behind the scenes, but not, not really, not that much. In the infancy of responsive design, sites weren't responsive as much as they were squishy. Most sites strive to be responsive by scaling down the layout only resulting in bloat. So you take what you've built and you add a layer of complexity onto it by making it this squishy site. Um, you're not really changing much of the content, you're just doing something new to it. And display none only hides the content. It doesn't prevent an image that might be not displayed from loading. Um, all of that stuff is still there. All those assets are still being served. Uh, it's only being hidden. So there's a lot of variations to consider outside of just this scaliness or squishiness. Obviously, there is screen size and resolution, or orientation, I'm sorry. There's also browsers now for mobile devices, whereas it used to be with iOS specifically, you were kind of stuck with Safari. Now you have multiple browsers on every device. Um, so just like with desktops, mobiles, mobile now has multiple browsers to check against. There's capabilities that are unique to phones. Um, that aren't available in other phones. These are like progressive enhancements that certain phones or tablet devices give you that you wouldn't otherwise find. Input types, physical keyboard, software keyboard, uh, whether voice is available as, an, as a uh, communication to the device. These are all variations to consider when talk, thinking about responsive web development. And they can affect the libraries and frameworks that you use, the assets served. If you've been in this room since this morning, you've heard, uh, a really good talk by Chris Schmidt about this very thing. Um, this is a huge part of responsive design, like the assets being served to the, the client are huge. Um, the forms being used in the way that you're using them, putting, typing a form input in a touchscreen device is one of the worst experiences on the internet. It's miserable. And button size and placement are all affected. Um, Apple recommends like a 44 or 40 by 40 pixel button as the minimum for user inputs. Um, this isn't something that a lot of designers consider ahead of time. And so there's something that it's something to consider when working in a responsive environment. This is a list of devices that were released in one month in 2012. Obviously the first thing you'll notice is the sizes. But each of these devices has a different screen, a different set of capabilities. If you look at the Kindle Fire versus like the uh, Motorola Android, uh, they're relatively the same resolution and size, but one would be considered commonly a tablet and another one would be considered a mobile device. The lines between these two sort of devices are skewed. So now it's not simply just like tripling of the amount of design you have to do. It's a very gray area in between these elements. It's not just like we have to do mobile, tablet, desktop but there's all this like fuzziness in between. So optimizing on capabilities rather than scale is the best way to kind of resolve this issue. So what do I mean by that? Linear scale is like Metroid. The responsive web should be like Skyrim. In Metroid, you start with a simple gun and you add new weapons, tools, and abilities as you progress through the game but ultimately the game follows a linear path. So you might go from like a mobile environment and scale up, 
but ultimately, there's one straight line from A to B. This is what that creates. You have a mobile site. It's got everything you need in it. You got a couple seats, an air conditioner, a radio, and it goes fast enough, I guess. And then you create this. And that's your desktop site. And it's got everything you could ever want, and it's got all the bells and whistles, and it's really kick ass. It's cute, and everyone loves it. But eventually, you have to cram this into this. This still exists on some level, but now it has to refactor. So that creates kind of a hodgepodge, clustered, smaller unit. In Skyrim, you advance your character in a variety of ways and complete quests, quests at will. So you have a bunch of different paths you can follow within the game. Um, ultimately, there is a kind of storyline, but the way you get from A to B isn't really defined. In short, don't build for this. Don't just build for a specific device. Don't just build on a linear path, but build for options and variety. Start with a core and ask yourself, is there anything available I can use to improve the user's experience on this site? Um, I jokingly said once uh, to a friend of mine, basically build for the smallest smartphone you can think of with IE7 and an edge connection and start from there and build up. Um, by starting with a core, all of that core assets are usable, but by the time you expand into a desktop environment, 90% of the site's written and you just have to make some adjustments. And a really good way to do this is through feature detection. Um, I use Modernizer for this sort of thing, to check against not what browser is be being used or browser compatibility, but can I use SVG in this environment or should I default to ping? It might be true for like IE6 that like, or IE7, I can't use SVG, um, so I got a ping, but maybe something down the road doesn't support SVG and it's nice to have that ping there as a fallback. So I'm not really reliant or dependent on browsers or how the browsers work. I'm dependent on whether or not a feature is supported. It's directly going from the feature to the CSS or the JavaScript and cutting out that middleman. So that brings me to rule number two. There is no responsive pixie dust. So I, I'm saying, you know, modernizer is a great way to fix this. That's, I went, I got ahead of myself with the buttons. <laughs> um, modernizer, uh, modernizer is a great way to fix this, but what does that mean? Um, I eat out entirely too much. I go out to eat almost every meal or order something in. It's a horrible habit, and New York has made it so much worse because I'm lazy and it's awful. Um, when I get bad food, it doesn't really bother me because I got this guy. I dump enough hot sauce on it until it tastes good, and it saves me from eating crap. Most responses to rule number one include adding new things to the project, like deliverables or designs, or like I said, modernizer. Um, this is a bit, this is again going back to that bloat issue. To avoid unnecessary overcomplication, we need to streamline process and new streamline deliverables. You can't just add something to the mix and expect it to suddenly be responsive. For me, this means rapid prototyping. Um, by getting in ahead of the project and rapid prototyping before design has been done, I can kind of anticipate the full scope of a site, a full scope of a build, and understand what things I need to exclude and what path I need to take. It gives me a, a measure of anticipation that is within the context and the medium that the end product is gonna be in. What I mean by that is I write this in HTML and CSS like I would a site, but I do it quickly um, using a framework, and I do it just for the sake of both communicating the layout and for my own sake of understanding the complexity of the site I'm building. This is a quote from uh, Jonathan Smiley. In the next five years, devices will be the name of the game. And it's not about screen size or browser we're talking about. Interfaces will change, input will change. The way we use the web will, ch will change. We need to start gearing up for that right now. And he recommends prototyping as a way to do that. Because like I said, it gets you ahead of the, the curve. It gets you ahead of the build process. Before you're told what to do, you can anticipate and give better comments, better reviews. Um, and figure out what you're gonna do before you actually do it. So the temptation would be to adjust the project workflow like this. Um, I've worked in ad agencies for a while. This is a pretty common workflow for me. I get a wireframe, uh, I look at a wireframe, that wireframe becomes a comp, I look at a comp, and then I go and build. 
Um, so uh, the, con the temptation is to do this, to go from now you have a wireframe, you, look at a, you build a prototype, and then that becomes a comp, and then that becomes a website. And again, you're still on that linear path. You've just thrown some pixie dust at the project and hope to make it different. This is, again, adding a layer of complexion, com complication to the process, and it does little to solve our root problem, which is the need to articulate fluid layout. Um, we need to communicate how something responds and interacts and becomes fluid before it's not fluid, before it's become fixed and static, because otherwise we're just converting something into a foreign language, something that it's not built in. We're, doing, we're, we're transcribing, and we don't want to be doing that in this, this sort of workflow. I use Foundation for this. Um, that's what I built that prototype in earlier. Uh, there's also Twitter Bootstrap, which is awesome for this sort of thing. Foundation by Zurb is, um, it gives you the ability to build something really quickly without having to think too much about CSS or JavaScript and just mark up a DOM real quick. Um, I'll even use Haml to kind of expedite the whole process a little bit more. But the goal is speed, not semantics, not like something you're gonna reuse or give to another developer, or, um, just fast and dirty. So that brings me to rule number three. Your workflow is gonna change. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I don't know why project managers love this quote so much, but I see it on their desks all the time and I felt like it was really true here. Um, if we want to create a different product, we have to change the way we create our product. Responsive web design means meaningful, requires meaningful deliverables. Um, the aim is to remove the big reveal. The thing designers do where they squirrel away for a few days and come back and go, ta-da, look at what I made. It's just too risky, says Mark Bolton um, of it, and I agree with it. Um, a lot of times, this sort of thing happens where you'll just get something and you're kinda told what to do with it, but then you have two things that are married together. You have the visual layer and the layout, or the visual brand and the layout, the branding, identity, color schemes, typography, it's married to the layout. So you give some, get some feedback from a client and they're like, well, I don't like the sidebar. What don't you like about the sidebar? I don't like that it's red. I don't like it that it's wide. I don't like that you know, it has this texture applied to it. It's kind of like going car shopping. And you're like, ah, I don't like the Ford Mustang because it's red and I don't like the leather. Like these things can be changed really easily, but let's get at the real problem first. Do you not like the speed of the car? Do you not like the, what it says about you? Let's figure that out and then we can work about, worry about the details completely agnostic of that layout layer. Uh, this is a friend of mine's wall behind her desk. She's a project manager and we were doing a responsive site and we had a really traditional client that wanted really traditional deliverables and this is how it started. Uh, there was a set of comps for tablet, desktop, and mobile. And it started pretty simple. Uh, the art director just made them all in Photoshop, printed them, posted them on the wall, gave them to the client. After about a month of back and forth with the client, tweaks and um, changes to the creative, it became this. Uh, eventually there was 30 to 40 PSDs involved in this project. A typography change, color change, took a week, two weeks, depending on how intensive it went. It was time consuming and for me, this would have taken 10 minutes and some CSS tweaks to make a small change. But for an art director, they have to go through file after file after file and make tweak after tweak after tweak. Instead of doing this, um, I've found style tiles to be an effective alternative to a traditional comp. Um, style tiles give you a chance to take those questions and have them answered in a, in a deliverable and in a format that is intuitive to the commentary being given. Uh, Samantha Warren, who came up with this, says that style tiles are design deliverable consisting of fonts, colors, interface elements that communicate the essence of a visual brand for the web. Again, the goal here is to get these interface elements and communicate about a visual brand without communicating about the layout at the same time. We wanna solve those problems separately. Iterate and communicate with the client using style tiles and rapid prototypes to articulate the end product. Um, again, by taking these two things and separating them, 
dealing with them separately, we can create a, a more substantial end product. Rule number four, your tools will change. Um, the way that you build a site is gonna evolve. In my first uh, apartment, I used one appliance for everything I eat. I talk a lot about eating, I just noticed. <laughs> and it was this guy. Everything, like grilled cheese sandwiches, chicken, hot dogs, anything that went in my mouth went through this machine. Similarly, when I did, started building websites, everything I built went through these, Photoshop and Go Live. And then one day I grew, you know, got big boy pants and moved on to Dreamweaver. Um, but it was a very like primitive suite. Now, I use a number of different programs. Uh, these are the things I open when I first get to the office every day. And they all serve a different function. Um, I use like Sublime Text to write code. I use CodeKit to kind of minify things and can, like uh, compile pre-processed CSS. Um, I still use Photoshop, but my suite has kind of changed. CSS preprocessors are one of the most important changes that I've experienced in the last year and a half. Um, they make responsive web much more manageable. Uh, specifically, SAS, by the use of things like Compass, can make it a lot easier to approach this sort of project uh, from the beginning. But they serve primarily, uh, the, best, the biggest benefit of them is they can streamline and organize your CSS. So with responsive web design, you are doing a lot of things in different areas, and there can sometimes be some confusion into how and where to do those things. Um, by using a preprocessor, you can kind of funnel all of that into single style sheets and not have giant bloated CSS files. Um, similarly, it's not just software that you need to change when writing CSS, but how you write it. Um, if you buy one book trying to figure out how to do responsive web design, it should probably be mine. But if you buy another book, it should be scalable and modular architecture for CSS. Um, this has been incredibly, an cr incredibly handy philosophy in writing CSS for me because, again, it takes those elements and doesn't tie them directly to each other. You can write modular elements and abstract things out, and it forces you to kind of think a little bit more about what you're doing as opposed to, like, apply a bunch of CSS styles to this ID and make it the thing and then move on to the next thing. Building scalable and efficient CSS is crucial to optimizing and maintaining responsive sites. Again, with, with responsive, that should go hand in hand with optimization. So rule number five, the web is responsive by default. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee said the web should be accessible from any kind of hardware that can connect to the internet, stationary or mobile, small screen or large. Um, and it has been. At its core, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, if you just throw a bunch of HTML on a page, it's responsive. It moves around. I mean, it doesn't look very pretty, but it's responsive nonetheless. It's fluid. We were afforded a luxury when a standardization of screen sizes came about in around 2001, 2002. Um, and that luxury was to just pull up a 960 wide comp and draw some images and create a website from that. But those days are gone, and they're not coming back. Um, we don't have that luxury anymore. And so it's time to like mature past it. In the responsive web, what you say trumps how you say it. Take for instance NPR. Um, they recently moved to an API structure for their content. And they develop content first. Everything with NPR, it can be um, video, it could be uh, art, audio articles, or it could be written word, and it's all thought about first in the content perspective. Within a really short period of time, they were able to launch a large suite of apps, each one that uh, appealed to different users and different demographics on different platforms, uh, web apps, mobile apps, desktop apps, and they did it because they had this API. The content was taken out from the actual form it was presented in and made accessible across devices. Having an API has allowed us to, at NPR.org to be highly efficient at building new platforms, uh, such as iPhone, iPad, Chrome, and apps, because we only have to build the presentation logic. The data is ready to go. So by pulling the data out, 
you then only have to think about the presentation of it. And that's, again, the response of web. Like, it's all about the presentation. The data shouldn't matter. Um, smartphone use by teenagers has tripled in two years. And uh, in five years, most Africans will have cell phones, or smartphones. Um, this stood out to me, because again, we're talking about data, and we talk about how mobile devices and tablets are for consumption. These devices are highly popular among the people who need to educate themselves, who need access to content. Teenagers, while they like, we like to joke about how they're doing things or whatever. Um, <laughs> doing things or whatever. Yeah, dude, that's an awesome quote. <laughs> oh, and then I did that. Um, so it's the, the smartphone use has tripled by teenagers in the last few years. These guys are not just like goofing off on words with friends, but they're also like accessing information because they're in the process of being educated. These are the people that we're educating um, to enter the workforce. And the most important thing to these people is the data. Um, Africans having smartphones. Again, we're talking about people that are, um, that finding data, finding content, finding information can be the difference between building a well for their village and not. And making this data accessible to these people is absolutely crucial. And we can't just like siphon off that data into a, the, the portal we deem fit. Um, laptops, desktops are expensive. Handheld devices are affordable. They're, they're cheap, they're easy to get. Um, and again, the desktop devices, the laptops are for creating, the handhelds are again for consuming. People that have budgetary constraints and need to consume data from the internet are going to lean on the side of mobile and tablet devices. This is uh, outside of my apartment after Hurricane Sandy. Um, my apartment is in the Upper West Side and we were relatively un unscathed after the hurricane. Downtown, Lower Manhattan wasn't so fortunate. Um, so the days following, this was on every sidewalk. Everyone was charging devices, and the devices they were charging were always, almost always cell phones and sometimes tablets. That's because these are the devices you're most connected with. Your cell phone becomes a sort of extension of yourself. It becomes an extension of your personality at a certain point. And in times of emergency, in times of entertainment or recreation, es escapism, you're gonna to turn to these handheld devices. In times of emergency, you're gonna to go to the thing that is most accessible, is most immediately on you, and has connection, regardless of Wi-Fi signal or things like that. Um, you use your laptop when you have the luxury of the space and the ability to use it. Determine what you have to say, and the format will be obvious. Take, for instance, The Onion. Um, the Onion has one thing to say, and it's satire. They are only making jokes. They're not doing a bunch of different stuff. It's not a very complex operation. They come up with jokes and they say it. This is their site before a responsive redesign. Um, you might be familiar with it. It's a pretty straightforward website, uh, kind of a newspaper site. This is it after. It's almost the same thing. There's some, been some things pulled out, some design tweaks made. Uh, it's a little bit more streamlined. It's a little bit more focused, a little prettier. But essentially, it's the same thing. Because what they have to say hasn't changed. They're still saying the same message. They just needed to change how they said it and make it a little bit more efficient, a little bit more friendly to this new experience. As the web matures, we should acknowledge and embrace its constraints. The aesthetic those constraints can't produce. When we do, we might discover that the true web aesthetic is hardly visual at all. At the end of the day, uh, the data that we create online gets consumed in a variety of ways and a variety of devices and eventually by a variety of applications. The truth of the web and the, the whole concept of the web of things that's been around for a while is that it's the data that matters and the presentation is on its own way. It's just how we bring it about. And maybe it's not even visual. Maybe at some point it's not, the responsive web doesn't matter because we're not using browsers anymore. But at some point, this changes, and the core of the web is the data behind it. So that brings me to the last rule. Embrace unpredictability. Um, everything will change soon, and 
before you do anything, before you start engaging in the technologies that we use every day, you need to anticipate this sort of uh, change and evolution. By bracing for it, by getting ahead of it, you're more equipped to deal with it when it happens. Um, so with that, uh, that's my, those are my slides. Um, again, my book is called The Responsive Web by Manning. Um, if you use this code, you can get 33% off. Um, it's something I kind of did to benefit you guys. And the reason I'm doing that is because I, it's in what's called a MEEP format right now, which stands for Mer Manning Early Access Program. Um, and this MEEP format, I'm not done writing the book. I'm still working on it. But while it's in this MEEP format, I can get feedback from my readers and integrate that feedback into the writing of the book. Um, it gives me a chance to write content that you're looking for, um, that you want, because everyone in this room represents uh, 10, 20 people who aren't. And so the more people, the more feedback I can get ahead of time, the better book I can get out of it and the more useful the information becomes. Um, thanks everyone for your time. Thanks to um, Brandon and everyone with HTML5 Texas to like let me come up here and do this. Um, I'm probably pretty early, so if you guys have any questions, uh, now's the time. Any questions? Yeah. Um, it depends. So uh, just to make sure I get this right, uh, you're asking how the clients perceive the use of rapid prototypes um, ahead of time, yeah. Um, it, it varies from client to client, and it varies on relationship. I mean, anytime you're doing something new and different, there's a lot of trust that has to be in place, and so you have to work on those relationships. I have a, a lot of open lines of communication with my clients um, and designers, project managers, the people on my teams. So that sort of thing comes about naturally. A lot of times when I'm new to a project, um, we'll go with a more traditional approach to the workflow because that relationship hasn't been established. Um, so it's right now it's something that the clients need to be eased into, but they're getting more receptive to it. Um, so does that answer your question? Um, so right now it would be like probably one in four. Like one in four projects, we do a, 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 this streamlined approach. Um, most clients have established contracts. They have a way that they're familiar with working. So it's still like, it's something that I have to fight for every day. It's, um, it's definitely like a big part of my life now is just kind of advocating for this process and I have to be like really repetitive and say it a lot, but um, over time, clients move towards it because they find that the end product is a lot better. It's a lot more intuitive and it functions a lot better. And there's ways to kind of get around this process without like the client really knowing about it. Um, and that's internally, like you can work internally on teams. One of the things I do a lot is like, uh, say I have a designer who I'm new worth working, working with, I'll get a comp from them for a desktop site and I'll recreate it in mobile. And I basically just uh, keep them in the loop every day, twice a day. Here's what I've done, here's what I'm thinking, what do you think, how does this relate, do you think this makes sense? Give them chances to give me feedback. If they want to design a new element, they can before I've done a huge amount of legwork. Um, so it becomes this sort of iterative process, but ultimately at the end, I like, scale the site up to look like that desktop comp. So once I start getting into the desktop view, it looks exactly like the composition, or the comprehensive. Um, so you can kind of do this on your own internally and talk about it with people while you're doing it. And over a while, like over uh, some time, the team starts to get a sense for it and you kind of become more agile and your workflow sorts of, sort of evolves, if that makes any sense. Uh, anyone else? All right, um, thanks a lot. <laughs>